Hi, this is Dr. Lisa Naj, and I'm here today to discuss environmental medicine and how it impacts our uh, youth, people on the island, and people around the country. Today we have two people who have come forward to tell their stories briefly and their success with the utilization of environmental medicine techniques, which basically means getting to the cause of why they got sick and then trying to fix it quickly, expeditiously, and prevent disability and permanent uh, inability to work or go to school. So first I'm going to interview somebody named Lisa and she has had a long illness and came here a few weeks ago for some help. So why don't you just tell me a little bit about how long have you been sick? Years. How many? Years. Like I mean I've been disabled for like nine years um, and sick for probably most of my life really. And what would you say the name of your condition is? Um, well, I have um, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, mold um, illness. Um, I got sick from toxic mold. I have um, chronic Lyme disease. Um, I have multiple chemical sensitivity now as a result of, of all of this. Um, so you understand that you may have had mold exposure and then it made you sensitive to all chemicals after that? I believe so, yeah. And How's it been going with um, support from the medical community and from your family so far? Um, the medical community I haven't gotten really that much support um, besides from environmental um, illness doctors who know about this field. Um, I went years being misdiagnosed. Um, I ended up losing my career, my home, um, my everything. Um, and basically ended up on the street because they kept misdiagnosing me, um, you know, with things like fibromyalgia and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and, um, and ended up um, unable to function completely and, um, and lost everything, ended up on the street because... And when, I, when somebody called me about you and said that you were um, cold and living in your car, why would you live in your car? How is that a good... Is that a good place for somebody who's chemically sensitive? Because it happens a lot. It does. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's a good place, but you get to the point where you can't tolerate um, any buildings. I mean, I or houses. I tried to stay with um, many friends um, who, you know, took me in and tried to get somewhere where I could get some, you know, relief and kind of heal. But um, if they had any level of indoor toxic mold. Um, or if they used a lot of cleaning chemicals um, or, you know, fragrance sprays or anything like that, I would get sicker. Um, so I was never able to, you know, live anywhere for an extended period of time. I would have to leave everywhere. I mean, my symptoms were just um, not something that you can tolerate. How do you do on Martha's Vineyard where the air is clean and you can go to the beach? Um, I do really well when I'm at the beach. I probably feel the best when I'm outside in clean air at the beach. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm, because I'm so, um, you know, they, you get kind of this toxic overload and, um, you know, it's, it's, you can't tolerate many buildings, um, you know, until you get a chance to kind of heal a little bit. Um, so being outside, I find helps in the beach really helps. And that's why in environmental medicine we use oxygen to help give a higher concentration of oxygen to heal the capillaries that are damaged from your toxic exposure. So we've been doing oxygen, intravenous vitamins, and sauna a couple times a week mm -hmm. to get your toxins out, but it can make you feel sick. So I don't suggest to people on their own, for you at home, to do sauna until you've had your heart rate and your adrenal function checked because some of these patients will get fast heartbeat from damage to the nerves. It's called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And my feeling is that the constant beating of the heart when you stand up, because the veins are dilated, make people fold their arms, cross their legs, and shift or lean, and they can't think that well when they're standing up. Did you have that? Um, yeah, to some extent, yeah. Um, fast heartbeat, you know, palpitations. I had a lot of cardiac symptoms. I still kind of do. Um, Are you on a, a drug that's um, helping to 
control the heart rate? Uh, yes. And that's, um, what one's that? The Cortef and the, the Midadrine. Yeah. And the Cortef is specifically for people with low adrenal function. And what we think we've discovered through some of the patients I've seen is that that beating of the heart for years burns out your adrenal gland. And you're trying to release a hormone called aldosterone to raise salt and water in the body and prevent the fast heartbeat and prevent shock. And the adrenal gland gets tired. And some people will get Addison's disease or moderate adrenal insufficiency which both of you really are being treated for right now. Mm -hmm. And I feel that um, replacing the hormone and giving the person midadrine makes them be able to tolerate the next step, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of treatment. And no one should get in the sauna if they're already unstable. Um, how did you do when you walked in here today in this nice new building? I mean, um, <laughs> I feel, you know, it's not as, I mean, some buildings I walk in and within like, a couple of minutes, I'm like, okay, I really need to leave. Um, so far, I mean, I've been in here maybe 10 minutes, um, and it's it's not too bad. But I mean, you can I, smell I fresh chemicals. Been, but I, I can a bit. I can smell something, yeah. But I mean, it's it's not horrible for me. But I'm just you know. Well, in the in in closing, before I interview the next person, I just want to explain how difficult it has been for you that you can't earn a living, you're disabled. You really can't, you have insurance that's covering you because you're disabled. And one of the things I was thinking is that if Medicare paid for neutralization and provocation allergy testing, which is very helpful for people to do treatment uh, when they're chemically sensitive, then young doctors would go into this field. And because Medicare doesn't pay for that, for the disabled, we don't have a young crop of doctors. We have people like me who got sick, who are older, and we need more physicians who are interested in integrative and environmental medicine. Would you agree with that? I, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. They're not taught about this in medical school. I mean, I went to, you know, dozens of doctors. I saw 12 neurologists over the years, 12 um, in the state that I'm from, and nobody could diagnose me. I was getting chronic migraines every day, and, um, and I was in horrible pain, and just, you know, they, they have no idea you know, and that's how I got misdiagnosed for so long. They don't even think, well, your house is making you sick or where you work is making you sick or it's, it's not even on their radar at all. And I was going to mention Harvard on my website, which is lisanagy.com, there are some articles, four articles at Harvard by Dr. Joe Brain, and he uh, determined that the cytokines, the chemicals produced by the white cells, are completely changed when you're in a moldy environment. Mm -hmm. So now there are a lot of publications in the traditional literature that support uh, the things we've known all along, like air pollution leads to autonomic uh, nervous system damage and nerve damage, and therefore people die earlier in a city because of pollution. But also indoor air pollution is a big cause of autonomic change, of nervous system damage, and whether it's via these cytokines or other mechanisms. And what we don't understand on Martha's Vineyard is that we're the center of mold. Here we are with a new hospital, an old hospital joined to it that was moldy, and the doctors are in the old hospital getting this damage themselves. And there's some articles now and a book being written about dementia and mold. So we have a crop of teachers, superintendent of schools, principals, people working in all the public buildings, the courthouses, the lawyers, the judges. Everybody potentially has a little bit of mold exposure on the island. And what I found, it's really quite fascinating, that kids in schools are getting autonomic changes. They're getting damage. They're then using stimulants instead of midadrine. They're using things that vasoconstrict, like caffeine, mm -hmm. nicotine, amphetamines, and cocaine to treat their disease. And luckily, you didn't go that direction. But you can see how people would self-medicate yeah. with something that was like midadrine, and midadrine doesn't go into the brain, crossing the brain barrier, so it's pretty benign. It just makes you be able to stand up and think mm -hmm. or work and go to school as opposed to wanting to lie down to study. So I've tied the addiction crisis to the moldy school or the moldy building on the island. So if you want, I was going to talk to Zoe, and you can sure. head out if you'd like. Yes. And thanks very much for coming Thank in. Thank you. Okay. So Zoe, we heard from one of your compatriots at the clinic. And I thought your story is quite unbelievable. So why don't you tell me the name of your condition, 
how long you've been sick and how you're feeling after a week of treatment. Um, I've been sick in total for about three years now. Um, I was first diagnosed with CRPS or complex regional pain syndrome. Um, what made my diagnosis kind of different than the regular, I guess, um, I didn't have a injury that brought it on and it wasn't post-operation. Um, so I just woke up one morning and my ankle hurt and the pain quickly spread to my leg and then throughout the past three years it's gone full body as this disease is kind of its nature. Um, I was also diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Uh, in the beginning of the first year I was diagnosed with CRPS, which hasn't really been, um, sorry, hasn't... Elucidated, like the cause yeah. of it? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, we don't have a really cause of it, and it hasn't been symptomatic until this year. Um, but I also have POTS, uh, that was two years ago now, I think. The fast heartbeat The fast condition. heartbeat, um, all of that stuff, which usually those things kind of go together, and there's not much like research into why they go together so well. It's just a lot of stuff is failing at once. <laughs> and, and have you been to school recently, or have you been unable to attend school for how long? Um, I've been unable to attend school for the past three years, really. I've had times where I go in for maybe two months at a time, but I, I quickly fatigue when I'm there. Uh, my pain rises through the roof, and I, I, after a few months of going fairly consistently or up to four times a week, I usually it just wears me out really quick. And Well, part of the issue is they say 40% of schools in the United States have toxigenic mold in them, and they don't maintain the HVAC systems that well, or if the roof leaks, it takes them about a decade to repair it, and uh, even they used to build schools on toxic waste sites because it was a good place to um, put a building and get cheap you know, land. Um, so kids sometimes have been, uh, you know, subjected to more toxicity than adults who would look out for themselves, maybe more. Um, do you understand when I talk about kids in schools, let's say on Martha's Vineyard, or doctors at the hospital, or lawyers at the courthouse, people who have chronic exposure in a building to mold, do you think there's a disconnect between what people believe can happen and they don't really put it together until it's too late and then maybe they believe what we believe and then nobody believes them either? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I think um, there's so little information that's like easily accessible about this topic. Uh, you have to be on your last leg to like get there. Like you have to search so hard through so many different loopholes um, to get to a place of like, well, maybe this is because of my environment. Maybe this is not how, not because of what they've been telling me, you know? Maybe there's a reason why I just got spontaneously sick, you know? Like really sick well, all how, of the How old are you? I'm 14. Yeah, so you're 14 years old and you haven't really been able to go to school for three years. And some building that you got exposed to uh, in your life, whether it's the school or other buildings, may have been moldy and this made you sick. And then we're sort of working you up. But also we've done some treatments that are fascinating. So I've been asked to speak at Harvard about the utility of a specific drip called alpha lipoic acid. And it's useful in peripheral neuropathy. Orally, they use it at Harvard and uh, Beth Israel and other institutions to help uh, with mold exposure, in our case, but also they know about it helping with neuropathies. It's an antioxidant and it's very helpful um, in the mouse study of uh, a mouse example of Lou Gehrig syndrome. So they have people who have uh, Lou Gehrig's and um, they don't realize that people could benefit from intravenous ALA. So this is your profound moment. Why don't you describe uh, what it was like to uh, get that drip? It was really amazing. I didn't expect um a pain reduction. I mean, I, I didn't think that it was possible to get like such a significant pain reduction and it being so easy. And that's what really confuses me is if we, like I, it's, everyone is different, everyone's experience um, with CRPS and with all this stuff is uh, different. But if I mean, it was such an easy thing and my pain just went down within the first five minutes of dripping and it was like down lower than it had been. In, 
a year in a very long time and like significantly to where And the next morning when you came in, you still had some relief of the pain. It didn't all come back. It didn't all come back. No, that surprised me even more <laughs> that it didn't come flooding back by the moment I woke up. You know, I didn't wake up with a headache and yeah. I didn't wake up with like my joints screaming at me. And it was, I was just like, you know, it kind of pisses you off because it's like, why didn't they do this earlier? It's so easy. Well, the problem is, is that it's hard to communicate like a clinician like myself um, who doesn't do research, who's not at Harvard, or n I went to Penn and Cornell Med, sometimes the bridge isn't connecting between clinicians in integrative or environmental medicine and people in academic medicine. And I feel they could learn a lot from people with what they would call anecdotal experience, but I learned this because they're doing it in Europe, they do it all over the country in integrative offices, and ALA is um, easily obtained uh, from compounding pharmacies, preservative free, and I just gave you uh, 50 milligrams the first dose over an hour, and the normal dose is 300 milligrams. So now we're on 300 milligrams, we just started low and made sure that you didn't have any negative side effect, and now it seems to be helping more and more every time you do the drip. Yeah. Yep. So the idea would be, also we communicated with a physician at Brown who's in pain management, and he's fascinated because he saw you a few years ago and he has heard that ALA was useful. And now I was explaining to him how we give ALA, how we need to treat the, um, the adrenal insufficiency, how you needed also to be on midadrine and Florinef to raise your blood pressure and slow your heart rate. And you're sort of becoming more stable, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you needed to implore, let's say, physicians at the hospital or the CEO of the hospital here. What would you ask? Would you have any uh, request that they do something that would benefit the rest of the country by being, let's say, a model here for understanding these concepts? Uh, yeah, um, I think it would be huge if like one of the biggest mold-ridden places like <laughs> ever uh, were to actually speak out about it and um, you know make it more widespread like mainstream information that yeah you can get sick from your house or you can get sick from an apartment or a job or whatever it is um it's not just a haywire like coinky dink you know right like, like you just get it out of the yeah. blue and there's no reason therefore mm -hmm. there's no treatment but yeah. covering it up with a pain pain medication because who would want to be starting pain medication or ketamine or opioids at the age of 14 or 13. Yeah, I was 11 when I got sick and I I was just, like the doctors just kind of said, you know, this is it, there's no really rhyme or reason. And I was just supposed to like, just Deal with accept it. that I was sick for no reason <laughs> at all. And I was really sick, I was in a lot of pain. I, it was CRPS is supposed to be one of the most painful conditions, I guess, but, um, I was in a lot of pain. I was very young, and I didn't really know how to like conceptualize. Like the doctors couldn't help me. You know, my parents couldn't really help me. There wasn't any opioids that I was interested in. You know, I didn't want to. And your parents have been taking you to many practitioners yes. for evaluation, mm -hmm. treatment. Spent a lot of money out of their own pocket, and um, really, this drip is, you know, relatively speaking, you could probably do six drips for a thousand dollars. Let's say, over two weeks maybe, mm -hmm. um, and really compared to how long you've been sick and unwell, that's a bargain, yeah. uh, even if it wasn't covered by insurance. But the idea would be that some of these treatments could be now studied at Harvard or Brown, and then they could make it uh, more routine for all the other people who have these um, reflex sympathetic dystrophies or other pain syndromes, or I've given it in Lou Gehrig's patients and videotaped them. So I'm gonna pre present that information, and it's just fascinating that I have learned from sort of these old masters in integrative medicine, um, some of the treatments that have been really used for 20, sometimes 30, 40 years. Even food sensitivities can trigger a problem. So environmental medicine doesn't just deal with mold. We deal with solvents and pesticide exposure, with industrial Wi-Fi, like at a school, how that can make the kids even worse if it's a moldy school and then they have Wi-Fi or if they have uh, cell phones that they're holding all the time. People who become chemically sensitive, sometimes you know about this, right, will become electrically sensitive, and then they don't like lights, motors, the refrigerator, all of these things that sound crazy, and it's really time for people to listen to us and stop giving us a label. So thank you so much for 
you know, coming today and telling your story because you lend credibility to the subject matter and you could probably help tens of thousands of people who have pain syndromes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I really appreciate everybody watching today's show and I think I want to really explain the crux of what I've been seeing in the practice with patients over the past decade. Um, We've got mold issues on the island and around the country from Superstorm Sandy and hurricanes and um, buildings that weren't built to be used all year round, not heated, not air conditioned. We're not maybe realizing that climate change has increased the temperature a little bit and so mold is growing more easily perhaps in buildings and we need to keep the humidity about 50% or 40% in the basement in order to have our house not grow mold even if there is no water intrusion. But then we have buildings that have significant, you know, buckets in the hallway of the hospital for 30 years, I've been told. And the school, uh, many of the schools have been in the newspaper lately for having major mold issues, yet we are not reaching out to each other about the health effects of mold. So I've spoken on Netflix. There's a, t a TV series called Afflicted. I've spoken in Congress. Uh, on, to the Veterans Health Subcommittee about toxic exposure and mold exposure in veterans. And $100 million was appropriated for research into this area, leading, often these exposures, leading to dysautonomia. And I'm working with uh, Wes Ashford at Stanford University on this area, and he was the person who was able to obtain that congressional funding. I gave a talk at the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, and Linda Birnbaum is the chairman there, who is really the leading toxicologist in the world running this government agency who has given me a letter that I should maybe be involved in a presidential commission on health care. So we need to let people who, especially physicians and especially females who have become sick with environmental illness to explain that the entire society is exposed to toxics all the time whether it's a mold, a solvent, a pesticide, what you do for a living, the new carpeting, a printer with new ink, and we are representing the sickest of the sick. So the canaries in the coal mine, some people would say, but we're trying to reach out to what are normal people and explaining you need to hear us and understand that we do not have some sort of mental illness or some sort of figment of our imagination but we are scientifically explaining why people react the way they do, their behavior, their medical situation, why they have a disease and that it could be solved, especially if it's just related to food sensitivity to wheat or milk or, or something simple. But the, the problem is people are too busy to learn new information. And I'm saying we need to stop not work so quickly for insurance purposes to see 30 patients a day, but really look at the etiology of why the person got sick. So you ask, when did you get sick? What happened before you were ill? Do you have a musty basement? Do you do photography or oil painting? Can you think of a toxic exposure you've had? And my biggest push is really the opiate addiction crisis. I've been speaking about this recently. When the person at a school ends up with autonomic damage from the mold exposure, they can get the fast heartbeat called dysautonomia. It burns out the adrenal gland and then you get sometimes adrenal insufficiency. You can't handle stress, you crave sugar, you crave alcohol. There was a very famous paper by Tintera in 1965 and he discussed that alcoholism is related to craving for sugar in some patients and low adrenal function. I did not discover this, I just treat it and promote the knowledge about this subject. And what I've discovered is that the misery of adrenal insufficiency, which is treated with steroids or hydrocortisone, is made to feel better when people use heroin or narcotics. So I've had many patients from the high school, teachers and students who have become ill from the school had the fast heartbeat, became addicted to amphetamines, cocaine, caffeine or nicotine, then drank, and then ended up on heroin. And I've watched the course of this condition over a 10-year period in some patients, and it has got to be transmitted 
to the superintendent of schools and the CEO of the hospital. I had a meeting with the head of addiction from Gosnold and the pre previous CEO and the superintendent that was previously in charge. Now everybody's changed over and we need to work together to really change our society and stop sticking people like me on the sidelines. We should be working with the doctors at the hospital, teaching them how to do urine testing for mold toxins at real-time labs covered by Blue Cross or Medicare. And there are other labs that do the mold toxins as well in the urine. And you can do antibodies to the molds and you can take a good history and you can measure the heart rate standing up instead of giving a psychiatric drug alone. We must determine who's got dysautonomia and treat it right off the bat. That's traditional medicine. There is no conflict of interest. There is no gray area. Our doctors do not know about this condition and some of them are suffering from it. They even have brain fog. They can't work at the hospital. They can't think. Is that the kind of physician we would like to have? So let's have an open forum on this subject. Thanks very much. Thank you.